Hey everyone, thank you for tuning in. My name is Mike Hausman. I'm the co-founder and chief data science officer of Rapport Boost. And today for our first ever interview, I have the pleasure of speaking with Roy Bahat, who is the head of Bloomberg Data. So he's a longtime investor. He's also an entrepreneur. He's built um, companies in the past. And Bloomberg Beta specifically has an interest both in the future of work as well as in artificial intelligence. So we'll be digging in a little bit about both of those. But first, Roy, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, just to start, um, I thought we should talk a little bit about workplace uh, and, and kind of people analytics and things of that nature. You and I both have an interest in it. And we've taught, thought a bit about how the workplace is changing. So. I'm wondering, from your perspective, what are the major factors that are influencing and changing the future of work? Uh, so I think there, there are two ways to think about the future of work. The traditional one uh, is if you went to like a conference 10 years ago about the future of work, the kinds of things they would talk about is working remotely and new management structures and how the organization of a company is changing. So I call that the future of working for us, meaning for companies like ours. And then the other way of looking at it, which is the way I've been researching recently, is more like the future of employment, meaning given how technology is developing and the culture is developing, what are the kinds of occupations there are going to be, what are people's career paths going to look like, et cetera, et cetera. And it's it's really hard to talk about one without the other because what happens, of course, inside an organization is affected by what people's choices are in the broader economy. And the number one factor, I think, in all of these things is technology. I mean, the change of falling cost of communication, increasing sophistication of the judgments made by computers, you know, that is a factor that drives both the future of working for us, so things like Slack and, um, you know, the many choices we now have for video conferencing and collaboration tools like GitHub, et cetera, et cetera, and the future of employment in the sense that it affects what occupations there's going to be both supply and demand for. So that's number one. Number two is demographics. Um, and the single most obvious and overlooked demographic change, meaning the change in the composition of the population, is just the aging of the workforce. Um, you know, we all look and see statistics about how the, the population in general is aging, yet somehow when we start talking about the future of work, we go down this path of talking about millennials, and yeah, millennials are going to be essential to the future of work because they are young and they will be here in the future. But if you think about the composition of the workforce, it's going to be much more important to figure out how older workers function because as a proportion of the total workforce, there's just going to be much more of them than of any other group. Does it touch at all on some of the fears I think people have around automation and robotics? The, the Bureau of Labor Statistics does this official categorization, I think you know, of occupations. And they classify some occupations as routine. Um, and it's not a perfect categorization, but it's actually pretty good. And it's official, which gives it all kinds of nice standardization benefits. And let's just assume that the jobs that are routine are the ones that are more likely to be affected by automation. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out that the jobs that are routine are disproportionately held by older people. Mm. And oh, by the way, the, um, the kinds of work that are being done is alternatives to full-time jobs. So meaning not like a salary W-2 employee, but all forms of 1099, the gig economy, the cash economy, you know, call it whatever you want. Uh, those roles are also disproportionately held by older people. Uh, you know, there's this myth that we've had this massive boom in the gig economy from all these online platforms like Uber and Lyft and TaskRabbit, et cetera. The reality is the lion's share of growth in the um, alternative work economy has not been that. That's a tiny sliver. It's just been older people taking on alternative uh, forms of work. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I guess it's. You know, here in Silicon Valley and San Francisco, everyone thinks about the, the, the gig economy, but, you know, th this has existed before, right? There's a, the proportion of freelancers and contractors have been growing, you know, year over year. Um, yeah, I mean, it goes back and forth in the course of, over the course of history, where, you know, of course, before we had a formalized work week, in a sense, everybody was a peace worker. Mm -hmm. And the word job, actually, like the etymology of the word refers to a lump of work. 
And so that, you know, kind of the origin of the word has to do with doing projects and gigs. And we've done with Bloomberg Beta this research project for the last year that I know we've talked about together with New America, and it's called the Shift Commission. And we just tried to study the fundamental uncertainties about the future of work. You know, when many of us talk about the future, we tend to do this awful thing, which is we make a prediction, and then we plan based on our prediction, if, except that almost all uh, the history of official forms of knowledge, and particularly academic knowledge, shows that we're terrible at predicting. So why we continue to insist on doing this is really beyond me. What we did was instead of saying, oh, well, how many jobs are the robots going to take away, and how much is the gig economy going to grow, we said something different, which is let's do scenario plans. So instead of making a prediction, let's assume a lot of jobs will be taken away by the robots. Okay, now let's assume that won't happen. Let's assume that work will continue to shift toward alternative forms of work. Okay, now let's assume that stops. And then we compared and contrasted all those scenarios. And the truth is, you find there's not actually a lot of difference in some ways between those scenarios, in the sense that under any of them we'll have to deal with instability of income. Under any of them, we'll have to deal with an aging workforce. Under any of them, we'll have to deal with encounters with technology in the workforce. We'll have to deal with growing geographic inequality. I mean, there are all these background conditions that we don't focus on as much because they're not as easy to talk about that are actually much, much more important. Sure. No, I love the, the report. And I thought the different future economies that you guys had identified makes a lot, you know, it's scenario planning. And you're exactly right. You know, it, it could take on any one of those four are more likely a combination of them. So it's good to sort of right. project that out and think, well, what, you know, what are the things that have occurred to, that might lead us down this path or another one? So a lot of what we spend our time thinking about at Report Boost is uh, the future of work as constituted as by human and machine. So we're very focused on the technology sure. that's enabling humans. You know, what do you think are the most promising and exciting technology innovations that will equip us for the near future workplace? In the near future, I just think it is, this is going to sound boring, but it is the continued computerization of all the things. I mean, plenty of people's daily work experience is still moving paper from one place to another, doing a repetitive task, and you know that's all going to just transform. Uh, over a long future, which is to say, let's say the next 10 to 20 years, I don't think anything holds a candle to machine intelligence. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the idea that machines can make judgments that were previously too difficult for anything but a human to make, if a human could even make it, um, is super powerful because it will make the work experience more enjoyable for those who are working. It will threaten to eliminate certain kinds of occupations. Um, it will um, create a, um, uh, you know, I think a wind behind it that's going to make all software to date just look small by comparison. You know, the economists, I think you know this, you know, they never see computers show up in the productivity numbers. Productivity just mm -hmm. hasn't gone up by enough in order to show us that computers have had an effect. And I just think that's because we haven't seen the beginning of it yet. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, you, you do point out, I spent a lot of time reading the literature on information technology, and you're right, they called it the productivity paradox, because everywhere you looked, computers were changing the world, and the one place you wouldn't see it is in research papers, where they would find computers were having no effect. So that's that's interesting. And I think that makes a ton of sense as it's shifting to kind of more and more like white collar work. It'll, it, you're going to see these massive transformations. So let's shift gears a little bit. And I wanted to talk to you actually on semi related to what you were just talking about. Let's talk a little about artificial intelligence. I know you're an early stage investor in a few AI companies. What do you think are some of the most exciting developments in this space? So first, I think that it's hard to say because the numbers aren't public and many of our investments are unannounced, hmm. but there's a chance we're actually the most active investor in artificial intelligence. Hmm. Um, and the reason for that is that about six months or a year before the rest of the technology world started jumping up and down about AI, one of my partners spotted the trend and was reading some academic papers and talking to people who are a little ahead of the curve. And she said, hey, we should take a look at this. And her name's Siobhan Zillis. And I thought she was way early. I actually discouraged her from thinking about it. Uh, and I was totally wrong because she did a few months of work. And then we looked at it and said, oh, boy, we should just kind of spool our whole fund over uh, to start focusing on artificial intelligence. And 
you know, the phrase artificial intelligence is actually misleading. We, we tend to use machine intelligence when we write about it just because it carries a connotation of a robot that thinks and acts and looks like a human, when really, as you know, what we're talking about is a class of technologies that allow you to predict things that you have not yet seen based on things that you have seen and do all kinds of other judgments that previously computers could make. And uh, so you know, what, what I tend to focus on are the very mature forms of this technology. I mean, in a, you know, in a sense, just a linear regression is the most mature form of it. Uh, and uh, how we can use those to deliver immediate business value. And so companies like Textio, where we're investors, that uh, look at a job description as you're editing it and use data about past job descriptions to make recommendations to you in real time about how to change your writing so that you can get better results, more applicants, more diverse applicants, et cetera. That to me is an example, a quintessential example of this kind of applied machine intelligence, which is exactly what you know, what we're really excited about now. Orbital Insight, you know, does this looking at satellite imagery and, you know, applied doesn't mean easy. These things are still very, very difficult to do, but the technologies are mature. We're just figuring out how to make them, or the technologies are relatively mature and we're figuring out how to make them useful in a business context, sort of like the internet in the late nineties, you know, the technology was there, it's been used for a while and now it's about making it useful. Yeah. And so, and, and solving a problem. And that makes total sense. I think it's, it's funny you mentioned how artificial intelligence kind of became the buzzword of the day. Um, and it sounds like you were ahead of the curve. So kudos to you guys. I think, you know, relatedly, I've seen that in venture communities. And I'm wondering, are there any technologies that you think are, are overhyped or, or scary or just things to be cautious of? Well, I mean, look, AI in general is overhyped in the sense that lots of people are claiming AI for things that do not have AI in them. Um, and, you know, if I can claim that anything that has a regression in it is AI, well, then all of a sudden it's like, hey, uh, uh, you know, we're an AI company. Let that dot .ai to our domain name. So in that sense, there's too much hype. Yeah. That said, I think it's hard to overhype the actual potential of this technology. And in that sense, it's also very similar to the Internet in the late 90s where, you know, any average company you looked at was probably overselling itself. But in totality, all of the companies were actually underselling um, the totality of the opportunity. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah I, I tend to agree that it's not, uh, you know, AI or running a regression. It's the what, what problem is it solving, right? What, how, is, how is it making life easier? How is it automating work? Things like that. Um, so on, on the subject of autom optimization, I know you had mentioned Textio. A couple of the companies you mentioned, you invested in Textio, Digital Genius. They're really about optimizing language, saying the right thing, the right person at the right time. And it's a similar thesis to what we have. You know, sure. What, what gets you excited about those companies or just communication in general? Well, I, you know, language is the kind of tool that is definable enough that you can collect and data on it and you can share results on it because you're ultimately talking about strings of text. And yet, of course, so powerful, especially in a work context. So if you're looking at customer service or sales and you, you know, we've all had that feeling of you're on a sales call, you're talking to somebody, trying to convince them of something. And you just sort of have this feeling of, if I only knew the magic words, um, and more accurately, if I, um, if I only knew how to, um, you know, if I only knew what was going to happen here, you know, I'll give you an example in a sales context, which is if you're on a sales call and you know, the call isn't going to work. Well, all of a sudden, you can do a lot of things like stop talking to the person and save your time for other things. And the power of, uh, you know, we've, we've had a version of this predictive technology for a long time in the sense that we have been able to AB test things and send them out into the world and see what happens. But once you make the feedback loop fast enough where you can use it as you are doing the work, for example, as you're doing it with live chat, um, it's much more powerful. Yeah, uh, well, we, we definitely agree. Um, and we think learning from, you know, millions of conversations or in the case of Textio, job postings and doing that at scale is really exciting. You can potentially do better than a human copywriter, right? Or a, or a human right. agent. Um, and, you know, uh, and of course, we all know that you still need, at least right now, humans for so many parts of this. Um, and I think seeing where that interface is, of uh, what will a you know, partially machine, partially human system come up with, uh, you know, in the world of, 
of board games, everybody's been watching Google's DeepMind and its progress in winning at Go, which is a game lots more complex than chess. And, you know, the interesting observation a lot of people have made lately is that the machines have suggested all these creative strategies that humans never thought of, and it's now making the humans better players. And my guess is that means that the machines are going to have to up their game in order to beat these, you know, now newly inspired human players. Sure. It's, it's, it's human versus machine. Yeah, well, you know, it's yeah, kind of a death sure. match. It's great. I, I watched war games with my son uh, over the weekend. And, you know, it, it reminds me exactly of that, where, you know, we're just we're, we're encountering all of these questions about us and our tools and where is that line. And they're, they're, they're age-old human questions, um, and we're just dealing with them in an accelerated way. Yeah, great movie, by the way. Good call. That was great. <laughs> um, so it last, up. yeah, I love, love it. Yeah, in part because Russia. But yeah. yeah, yeah, that's true. It's it's kind of becoming more relevant, right? <laughs> I like to say, it's, you know, we'll have to see whether Russia wins the Cold War. <laughs> I love it. Um, so last question for you, uh, for founders of early stage AI companies, and this hits home for me, you know, what advice do you have? And, and if someone was approaching someone like you for funding, you know, what, what advice would you give them? I'm not great with advice, uh, <laughs> because I kind of think all advice is either, uh, uh, it's either the person is kind of ju justified the decisions they've made in their own life or use you as an experiment. So I, you know, I don't know that I have advice on what people should do in part because the great founders are going to selectively ignore great advice and then do their own thing. Um, that said, it, it's no different in AI from any other kind of business, which is the faster you can make something useful for someone, the better off you will be. End of story. Like everything else is nonsense around making something useful. Cool. Well, you know, I can say if somebody comes to pitch us, we're very early, and so it can be a concept. They don't have to have made anything. But if they could have made something, if in the time it took them to make their pitch presentations, they could have built a product, um, uh, you know, then that will cause a red flag. And at the same time, if they're committed to seeing how – if they're more in love with why it's useful than w with the tool – that's generally a really good sign. Mm. Um, and then, you know, we post our criteria for investment publicly on our website. We try to be the most transparent venture investor, and we work hard to keep those updated so that as I, um, you know, so that as I learn uh, what, you, you know, what we're actually deciding based on, we update and amend those public criteria. And, uh you know, it's really no different for an AI company than for any other company, which is ultimately we want to tickle some boxes. Like, do we trust this person? You know, the deal fair, all these things. What we're really deciding based on is, is there one concrete reason to believe that this company has a strong shot to be an outlier? Cool. Well, super helpful. And I, I disagree with your assertion that you're bad at giving advice because you've given me advice personally and professionally. I found it all to be very, very valuable. Thank you. Yeah. It's a, you know, helps when smart people are doing smart things anyway, because then I can take credit. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, Roy, thank you so much for joining us. Um, this has been great. And uh, yeah, we'll obviously we'll check back in with you at some other point and we'll pick your brain a little bit more about AI and the future of work.